today and we're actually joined with well, my future Dan, he's, he's down here, which is Sophie's husband. She could unfortunately couldn't be here today. So he'll be helping uh, moderating and as some of you know, he's also been involved of getting the Sector Economy Club uh, going in Reading as well. So we're delighted today to be joined by Oliver and Monica from REC, Waste and Resource Society. <laughs> um, and uh, we'll probably just crack on with it, try and keep it. I don't know if any of you, you know, have to drop out, then just feel free. We'll be recording it all as well, but we'll do about 15 minutes of conversation before opening up for questions. Um, also use the chat as usual, any questions that you have to kind of um, as we go, and then we'll have time at the end to also go back to them. First of all, uh, Monica and oh, Oliver, this will be quite exciting. Um, what did you bring for your circular conversation starter today? <laughs> right, we brought, we brought two, uh, two bottles. The first one is this one, which everyone will recognise. Yeah, Monica's got a different one. Have you got a glass one as well, Monica? Have you got... <laughs> <laughs> this one's a beautiful um, decorated or packaged uh, bottle of, I think it's oyster sauce or something, yeah. But I bought this one because it looks lovely. But this is, so basically it's glass and plastic. And I got the jar, glass jar. I'll put them there. <laughs> and so I suppose for you, do, the, do you see these kind of, they represent um, the part of the role that, that RE3 uh, plays in, in the, the community here? I, I, I think, I was thinking about this yesterday, and you'll have to excuse me, This you may be horrified by this, but I think that um, we, we sort of represent, if you like, the Hollywood blockbuster of, of circular economy in that it's probably not very not as responsive and as uh, nuanced as it might be, but it kind of works at scale, um, relatively works. You know, we can we can discuss that later. But I think that's where what what we have to do. We kind of try and appeal to everybody across the spectrum, which is not a problem at all. It's a it's a you know wonderful privilege to be able to um, to work at that scale, but. I, I suppose I was kind of anticipating you guys being kind of at the other end, maybe the kind of, um, and I mean this respectfully and, and, <laughs> and as a compliment, maybe the kind of art house cinema, you know, high end, really good stories, but not Marvel. Um, <laughs> and I, I'll just okay. explain it in that way <laughs> and shut up. <laughs> so, yeah, these two are examples of... Um, of what we're trying to capture we're trying to make as big a pile of these things as we possibly can and we know that sometimes that isn't really and that's why i make that kind of rather clunky um parallel really we know that that really isn't quite where we need to get to um but at the moment it still works at that let's try and collect as much of all of these things as we possibly can um on one hand glass represents something that is in theory at least endlessly circular to an extent to a greater extent plastic is has got <clears throat> some more uh, aspects to it which mean that it can be it can be circular up to a point i think monica monica and i visited a plant 18 months ago where i think probably about seven times around the system was was what they told us mm -hmm. um so the two are, are really important. They're, they're m m in mass use. They both represent things which can embody circularity, but ultimately um, we probably would end up favoring glass over plastic on the basis that in terms of circular, um, you know, in terms of it being round the, the cycle again and again, glass has got more, more scope. Yeah. Uh -huh. on, on that topic, and I suppose there are two um, quite, I suppose over the last couple of years, <laughs> plastic in particular have become much more in the, the public's awareness and, and you, 
you know, deal with the domestic waste in particular around um, you know, the resin, bracknell and, and working in area. We've seen that a lot of the media and a lot of growth in, in this kind of zero waste or plastic free. When it gets down to actually what you're seeing then <laughs> in, in um, your, your Hollywood blockbuster end, end of life uh, production, um, are you seeing changes? Are you beginning to see switches? Are, is there less plastic coming through? What, what, what types of rates and, and, and things do you see kind of at the end there compared to, yeah. to what there seems to be happening? Uh, we are seeing more. We, we were really fortunate, partly good planning, partly good timing. I'd be happy to admit that. But just before David Attenborough did his thing, we we were we were in, deep into the process of, of agreeing to recycle a far a wider range of plastics than we'd done locally. We'd always um, had some had to, uh, had a debate really around whether or not the yogurt pots, the plastic trays, all those sorts of things could be recycled economically, um, and that's a big consideration at that at that scale, obviously. But we managed to sort of square that circle and get that get that going and obviously everyone in the area now can put their yoga pots their trays their even um drinks cartons and things like that into their recycling so that really worked well for us but we are seeing some change in composition so things like pouches and refills some of the refills are plastic and we can recycle them some of the pouches are much harder to to, to recycle and so in, in in a sense what what sets out to be an environmental response actually is is a bit problematic so those sorts of things are and and are, you know you have to walk around the supermarket now and you see a lot more things which are in pouches so that composition change is is something we're living through now i think the forthcoming environment bill which is still sort of slightly tortuously going through um its committee stage i think um is is going to affect another change in that it will, um, it's going to introduce both at the collection end, some requirements on councils to collect a uniform set of materials. Good thing, because, you know, we'll all be aware of relatives elsewhere, or if you've moved from one part of the country to another, you get somewhere and you think, Crikey, you know, where I used to live, they used to collect X and Y and Z, and now all the other way around, you know. So that's going to be really good. But alongside that, and this is going to cause a bit of a problem, I think, for local government, um, particularly alongside that, they're going to be deposit return schemes where you pay slightly extra. It might be 10, 20 P on top of a product at the point of purchase. And you can recollect that back, redeem it when you recycle your um, glass bottle or plastic bottle, principally at a, um, a sort of reverse vending machine. So on one hand, we're saying to councils, you've got to spend a lot of money on having a really comprehensive collection system. But on the other hand, we're going to be introducing at the very same time an, a, a parallel and almost competing um, means of collection. And I think what that will do, and again, at large scale, it's probably a good thing in terms of the environment. It will cause producers and manufacturers of packaging to think much more about designing into, um, into the, the product or into the packaging uh, efficiency of 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 collection and, and and you know almost getting it back into that circular system so that's going to be a really good thing how we locally make that work whether we've all got to have a box in the back of our car or on the back of our bike when we go into the supermarket to take all the stuff back that we previously bought we wait and see but it's going to be very interesting and i think as i say that will have a an impact on composition as well yeah, two, two interesting things I think come up there, um, and this was both a bit around I was communication and dialogue <laughs> in the system, both upstream, you know, with the manufacturers and, and you know, things that you might be learning around design or, or problems that actually you face recycling when, when that changes. But then also, I know Monica um, works a lot around the communication and the outreach as well, changes for for us or the, the you know the general public on, on understanding what you know when things change what am i supposed to do now go on monica uh, sorry erica what was your last last bit <laughs> yeah i suppose it was just around um the challenges you sometimes face potentially around yes 
around communication, both with um, you know, the, the general public and what, understanding what to recycle, but also if new things are going to come in and change, but also things that you might learn to feed back to businesses or manufacturers that are causing difficulties or problems as well. Yeah, certainly. So I think that behavioural change that we are obviously facing to, to help he people to understand why recycling is a good thing, why they should do it, but also as a bottom line, just to change their habit is, is a big task. Um, uh, and I think we were potentially quite fortunate that the last, as Oliver mentioned, that three years now since Blue Planet, that awareness of the waste plastic it becomes so high up on the agenda so I might say that it probably make my work so much uh, so much easier because it was on the mainstream television uh, on the mainstream media we could open any programs uh, it was a moment that every week you could see a, a big news about recycling um, so uh, so it was definitely it was, it was an exciting moment and I do hope that it will continue so it definitely helped uh, and you earlier mentioned about, you know, whether we actually noticed the increase and you could tell that we did notice the increase. Uh, I think the year one we've been from the introduction of plastic, we got almost 60% more of the plastic recycled, which was a huge number. Uh, and it still continue. I think it's just only single digit this year following the, the, the next year of the introduction. However, we cannot forget that it's also a more to capture each year because it's still more and more being produced. So obviously sometimes in numbers, it cannot really look as good. Um, uh, yeah, so obviously that's a communication challenge. I do feel that we got a huge amount of residents that they are so supportive, that they so engaging, they know, oh, I'm not gonna say even basic, they got much more than basic uh, principles and rules about recycling. So they're doing every everything what they can. Uh, but I think my challenge is to make sure that we reach to to those who are not feel as convinced and uh, what we can say to make those not, you know, 100 people that are doing things perfectly, but have 10 that do it imperfectly. So, um, um, yeah, so I think, you know, it's, it's sorry, other way around, actually, yeah, we don't need to... <laughs> <laughs> but hundreds are doing imperfectly, so so that's I think that challenge that we probably need to uh, need to do and uh, uh, work work on. And so, in that area, are there um, particular types, particular messages, particular seasons that are more of a areas also that that are more um, of a challenge? I, I used to do work in London, and I knew that urban and um, flats and things were sometimes more difficult and things. What what types of challenges do you in particular have the area in, in increasing um, recycling rates or, or reuse um, as well? Yeah, so you, you hit the nail here in terms of the type of accommodation. I think that flat urban areas are generally very different. They got a little bit of different habits, different settings in their households. Um, so uh, Reading is, is quite interesting in that way because uh, a quarter of population lives in flats so uh, it's definitely uh, uh, something that need to, cannot be overlooked so that communication need to be uh, quite specific because um, you have that shared responsibilities when it comes to recycling you have to share it with your neighbors that you not necessarily know it's a little bit different story if you have to your own bin and you're looking after your own uh, on being at, uh, uh, that that you put in for a collection every every now and then, so uh, that's definitely different. I think what works very well is seasonal communications are really really well. It seems like at the moment that people kind of associate a waste a bit more. I think now we're coming to the Christmas. I think that's the very good timing for communications. Obviously, it is an overload of information. However, uh, it kind of feels that people are a bit more prone to do a good thing. Uh, because it's a festive season, it's different this year than usual, but it's still still that natural desire of, of helping out is there. So I think that kind of moments are definitely, definitely useful. And I think if anything else big happening in the world, what I'm trying to do is trying to have my eyes open and kind of trying to fit in and trying to at least uh, drip that information locally as much as, as we can. And I think I just want to repeat again that we're really fortunate. I think that residents 
here locally really got a really high sensitivity in terms of doing the right thing and uh, we just really hope that they will they will continue and they will they will help us to to uh, make more of these items landing in the correct bins <laughs> yeah it's interesting that, you, that it's nice that you get almost that vibe from the, the community that you're in as well um I think an area also probably linked to the media, but maybe not so sometimes so helpful for you is is this kind of understanding what actually happens to recycling afterwards, and that's maybe something yourself or, or Oliver as well is is that there's also quite often things where we see our recycling. I can't remember the program, uh, you know, breakthrough from plastic type things where it's ending up on the other side of the world, uh, Tesco bag, you know, these kind of things as well. Um, so what I think there's quite enough learning or incentive, what, what actually happens to it once it's kind of gone into my bin that goes to the recycling centre, separated, but then who uses it and, and you know, what, re what really happens down that, that angle? I think that's, that's an area if either yourself or Oliver um, could share um, some insight into. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Well, I mean, in terms of this, um, we collect those mixed from everyone's houses, mixed with all the other types of recycling for ease for the public. There are different ways of collecting it where you can collect them all different separately. And it's the kind of you know, sort of sort of thing that gets the Daily Mail quite worked up about having all these boxes and bins and stuff like that. And obviously there has been a proliferation of them, but we collect it mixed so that it's a bit easier for the public. Then we sort it at our, our plant. And if you if you come to small meets of the plant, as you drive in, the big building on the right hand side that you drive to the back of, in that first bit is our material recycling facility, which is a massive kind of machine which sorts all of those, all the different types of recycling that, that, that you give to us into their constituent parts. And quite often as you drive past, you can see different bales of material out the front. That's what we're doing effectively sorting out all the different types into into like material types so that they can go to be reprocessed in the case of plastics all our plastic is is reprocessed into into something like this this is a I'll get it as close as oh, we like a show and tell yeah yeah so these are <laughs> small little pellets of milk bottles so this is high density polyethylene and this is going to be made into new milk bottles um, this is Monica's got her clear plastic bottle, that's PET, and these that you can see there, they're PET as well. In This will often be turned back into food grade packaging. So where we, when we went to, to see our stuff being recycled, as I say, a short while ago, um, they were making that into uh, salad uh, packaging. Um, I think it was for the co-op on that occasion. So very quickly within, you know, you could measure it in days, very quickly after it's gone from here up to the Midlands, it's then being potentially turned into um, new packaging and it could be on in, in the shelves again very shortly after that. Um, so so that that's quite, that's quite good. You know, that's quite quick in terms of plastic. Um, there's a lot of washing goes on. So from a practical point of view, people don't have to spend ages and ages and ages washing their, their recycling before they put it out. We want them to send it in as clean as possible. But it, it's washed, the labels are taken out, any any sort of contraries or contamination is taken out. And then it's, 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 it's a very scientific process. It's almost like a lab because where they're making food grade products, again, obviously has to be clean. Um, the retailers want to know that it's all being um, done in a, in a safe environment and it's it's, it's really interesting, isn't it, Monica? It's, um, yes, it's and uh, we definitely helped with with uh, some of that. I kind of you know uh, giving a sneak peek to to people uh, by organising the tours to our facilities. So I think that was a kind of a breaking point to become a little bit more transparent, to be more open, to, to show people what actually happening with the recycling, what's happening behind the scenes. And so uh, with the two years now that uh, we started with Recycle Week, so we had like a regular tours uh, for public. You do not need to be organized group. You don't need to be um, a geeky environmentalist. And, <laughs> and you, you, you just need to be just anyone 
who is interested uh, and uh, would like to find out a bit more and we uh, let people and public to, to join us for, uh, uh, for those um, tours which were really really successful very popular we were very happy that we could we could do it and we we saw immense uh, gratitude and great feedback uh, really following this tour so it's something that definitely we will be carry on uh, in normal circumstances. This year was again a bit different. We offered, we connected via Zoom, not not so not the same because you cannot see it, you cannot touch it. Uh, uh, but uh, certainly it will come back next year. But uh, there was, uh, I think, a right route to to help people get a bit of the sense that it really matters. That small actions at home really have a big difference to quality of materials produced. What is actually in the bean, how it is separated, uh, how much effort is being put into that process. So that there are real people working there, obviously the huge amount of machinery works yeah. around the clock to, to, to do a job, but that's not enough. Uh, it's still uh, a lot of materials that has to be hand-picked. Uh, and uh, I think that was really eye-opening for, for a lot of people who visit there. Uh, that actually the real people are there and they have to uh, look for uh, those naughty items that shouldn't be there in the flat <laughs> first place. So, so that was helpful. And you must uh, find some strange things, probably also. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so I think you know it's, uh, and I think what, what also that tours and everything else. I think certainly for me, uh, being within that industry for the last three years, I, I I didn't. It's definitely not as easy and as simple as it may seem uh, be at the beginning. It's it's. It's a lot of uh, thought, a lot of process going into it. And, you know, even those two items we brought here, you know, it seems so natural thing. oh, zero waste, that's definitely glass jars. That's, that's what we should use. But, you know, I don't want to be a massive advocate for the plastic, but plastic has such a bad name uh, in, when it comes to the environment. And, but it got a lot of benefits as well. It's so much lighter than glass. If you think about the transporting it, even for recycling, that is a massive impact on the uh, energy consumption um, and you know, transportation, logistical. It's, it's a logistical mayhem to, to recycle glass because it's extremely heavy, whereas it's, it's not plastic, it's super light. We know that it can save life, we know that they can deliver water to countries where it needs to be uh, and obviously it's a useful material as well. And I think what is really common with both of them, we got a, a means to recycle both of those items and it, it's that easy. It's really simple because it's <laughs> you're just putting into recycling bin and just putting this one in a glass bank. Uh, but I think above all, and I think, you know, everyone here on the, in agree that obviously we can reuse it that's the best way to, to do it. I think, you know, don't check that jar or don't check that glass bottle if you can keep hold onto it for a, for a little little longer before putting into recycling bin. Um, so I think that will be kind of the key thing for everyone and trying to, but if you have to kind of finish it, it's, it's live, just putting into right bin. And I think that's a big challenge. That we, fortunately, we have the facilities to, to deal with that materials these days. They could come back, you know, they could become come into the circle and um, stay in that circle for, for a long time. But unfortunately, a lot of them is not landing in the right bin. And that's, that's, that's something that needs to change. Cool. I think I'm going to move on to some audience questions before everyone might have to uh, drop off. And as there's just a few of us today, I might invite people who have uh, a, popped a question in. Um, to ask it themselves if they'd like to. I know, Paul, you had one or two there about data. If you'd like, are you able to, or does your microphone work? <laughs> yeah, I was reminding myself what I've asked. <laughs> <laughs> a flow, a flow of questions. So. I did see it come up, Paul. <laughs> yeah, I, I know there's a couple, I suppose they're both, they're actually quite linked. So first one is sort of, I'm interested in you sort of were, were talking about um, the different streams and the different um, areas. So whether it's flats or rural or urban houses, I'm interested in how much data you have on what comes into the uh, waste stream. Um, 
and how granular that is. So whether you can sort of break that down. And I think the second question, which is sort of linked to that is, do you analyze the stuff that goes into the unrecyclable waste to see what could be recycled if we were, or reused if we were better at it, or if there were the markets? I suspect that's a large part because you mentioned uh, sort of the economics of it. I'll, I think we'll go for the second one first. Yeah, and we're just sort of awaiting some final um, results from an analysis that we've just undertaken on what's in, in Reading, what's in the grey bins. We've done it for Wokingham and Bracknell as well. And that's precisely the reason we do it, so that we can get an idea. I mean, it's, it's, it has to be an indication rather than, um, rather than for us to use it as almost kind of like a, a, you know, a, a certainty. But it does help us to track over time what's happening and and quite important for the councils where to focus um communications as monica said um and the types of services that we offer so that we can and and, and that's it really it's that marginal how can we get a little bit more out of what's be, currently being chucked away because we know that um with the best will in the world at scale some residents are putting things in the recycling that shouldn't be there and also there's still some recycling going in in the residual waste that's ultimately going to go and be disposed of. Um, so yeah, we, we think, and particularly, I guess you're all, all aware that in Reading, there's going to be a food waste collection commencing early in the new year. So at the moment, that's quite a, ch a large chunk of what's still in that, in the gray bin in, 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 um, in Reading language. Um, so that will be a real big, uh, a massive bonus for Reading. Um, and then in terms of the second bit, the sort of granularity of it, um, we tend to know almost it's, it's, it's most accurate on outputs. So we get waste in the back of a truck from a thousand bins that's delivered. And then we will either separate it out if it's recycling. So we know how much is going out of the facility. And if it's to go to residual waste, we know how much that is. And we kind of publish quite a lot of that data in our annual environment report, which you can get from the RE3 website for anyone who's interested. Um, I think I think the key thing is, I mean, Monica and I are hoping to be able to do some specific communications around that composition fairly shortly. We may be hampered a little bit by Christmas because people's attentions, obviously, and perhaps this year more than any, tend to turn to Christmas and, and other things. So it, we don't want to necessarily let that message get lost. But I think um, keep keep your eyes peeled and hopefully there'll be, be quite some some good granular info coming out fairly shortly. Were there any other questions that anyone wanted to bring up at this stage? I think Erica, just one point that Marielle raised about the tours, okay. we definitely go back to those tours in, in future. It was just this year that we couldn't have people on site really. So yeah. um, everyone- one thing, um, I'm really interested actually linked to that is, is I work in design, so the product design and engineering and particularly in tech products, which I saw the Environmental Audit Committee just uh, launched their report yeah. today on e-waste and the circular economy. And what, what I did as a designer about 10 years ago was actually working with some recyclers <laughs> to understand more what happened. And I think that's something, that link in that chain is something that still is, is missing quite a lot because you guys actually have so much knowledge about how things could be designed better to be recycled, to be, you know, repaired or, or bits to pull off, but it's all got to be fast and things like that. So is there anything that, that um, you looked at to feed back kind of to manufacturers and things to kind of spot or, or help them design better really, um, design more circular? Yeah, I agree with that. I think that's something that uh, it's loads of uh, cooperation going on between the waste management companies, designers, manufacturers. And I think there's new regulations that they will um, put mandatory use of recycled materials in producing a new item. That will be a key change uh, because, you know, it, it's great stuff that we can produce a bottle glass bottle or plastic bottle, but the key is to make it that this bottle is actually contained a high percentage of already used, so already recycled plastic or recycled glass in it. So we cannot 
extract, we don't need to extract the new materials, we can just keep using what is already out there. So I think that regulation, which are uh, coming hopefully soon in place, will make a big impact. And so, yeah, I think it's, it's so many of those uh, different items that we heard of uh, that they are really causing a big trouble. So I'm not sure if I can say the branding here, but it's one of the drink <laughs> oh, bottles. God. I'm getting trouble. <laughs> can I or not? We'll imagine, we'll imagine. What yeah. it be. Yes, soft drink, but fizzy drink, long bottle used for quite often sports uh, uh, refreshment uh, brand. Uh, apparently needs extra person to remove that sleeve because it's really long and it's that <laughs> good in cold. So yeah. that, makes, that makes a massive, I mean, it's, it's, it's so odd that that sort of product is still there. Uh, because of its branding, because of the design and the look, this is for manufacturing more important. And I'm not sure, not saying to obviously we should refuse and boycott it, but it, it is odd that that is allowed. In my my personal view, that should be this should Monica, not be charity. And Monica, on that basis, have you has somebody approached that company, whoever they may be? Uh, to, I personally to not, but I believe that uh, that was in the public uh, media, so I, I'm sure that uh, uh, they have been. Uh, so they are definitely a bigger name than mine uh, to to do that, to be much more a stronger voice. Uh, and uh, but I, I'm still seeing exactly the same shape and the same uh, bottle, and that's what we've been told. And I think you know it's a public knowledge. Uh, but unfortunately, if you are business, if you 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 know, if the regulations are not in place, you can you can still carry on. So I think, you know, those little things are, I do hope that the law is important to, to push that change. Um, so, you know, putting a, a small fee on the carrier bags make a huge difference uh, on, 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 you know, our end. We're seeing uh, uh, so much less plastic carrier bags in the, in the recycling. Uh, and that was just purely because it was a chair, you know, the structure, systematic change because of the fact that you have to pay. Uh, so it's just it's just less of it uh, in circulation. So I think definitely that sort of changes are, are, are needed. I think it works. At, I think just quickly, I think it works. At, it's going to continue to work at two levels. The report that you're talking about, Erica, this morning is working at, at that sort of technology and, and manufacturing level. And that's really, really important. But I also think locally, um, I don't want to be too bleak, but you know, we know in Reading that there are lots of people who can't continually change uh, consumer products all the time. And I, and I think there's going to be an increasing role for, I think there's, there's going to be an increasing role for repairing and, and trying to do things more locally. And I, I know that sounds, sounds lovely. I think in practice, it will be harder to do at the kind of levels that would make a difference. But I do think that's something that we are going to have to, particularly with our facilities, we're going to have to explore really fully to try and help people. If, if the manufacturers and people like you, Erica, who were designing things have got a far greater idea of how they're going to be dismantled and recovered at the end, that's a real tick in the box. But also I think below that, there will always be people who actually, as Monica started by saying at the, right at the start of this, reuse. Can we and maybe not even reuse can we just keep the thing going for longer and longer and longer yeah i mean i think that's where it's really interesting seeing the rise of the right to repair movement and reading's got their you know repair cafe and the bicycle kitchen as well but how can yes. we encourage that these are the easier and, and faster kind of all the better options for people to adopt as well i'm conscious of the time i don't know how long everyone has i know we've gone over we often ask a question when we remember um that if you both or, or one of you has an idea of somebody in the local area or a business or a kind of perspective that you'd be interested to hear from and we'll try and reach out to get them on as well to do that so i don't know are there any particular perspectives or things that you'd be interested to hear from Put you on the spot <laughs> i'm just being i'm sort of being silly um, i was wondering if monica was gonna come up with an idea but i have i mean i think for both of us i think it would be quite interesting and we would certainly be interested to to speak to them as well anyone on that repair side i i, I i'll go back to my awful and uh, sort of um parallel at the start or analogy of about kind of you know blockbusters 
we always feel we don't want to tread on anyone's toes because um, because we get hundreds of thousands of visitors a year and I, I wouldn't want to kind of get into their territory. But I certainly would be help, uh, so certainly would be interested in talking to them and hearing from them in this sort of a scenario, I think, around um, what they need, what they do, and, and sort of understanding a bit more about that, because I think that could be really, really helpful. That might not be a very good suggestion, but... Um, no, I think it's brilliant. And I, we've had some suggestions also on the side about Bristol's got a reuse yeah. kind of repair area, or I suppose in other countries, you're seeing these kind of joint, almost little social enterprises almost linked to the, the recycling and, and reuse centers as well. Um, I know we've gone slightly over time, but we started fairly <laughs> late, everyone. Um, thanks for for joining, thanks for, for sticking around uh, for that. Thank you very much to Oliver and Monica for taking the time out today to talk to us, for being so open and sharing. Um, we probably could talk to you all day and I think it is, it is a real interesting area. Like you're saying, Monica, a lot of people are very interested and engaged in this area. So um, if we can do anything to help or, or other things going on, we'll, we'll definitely um, share them or please share them with us as well. We've got a lot of people here who like to think of, and, and you know, Paul in the Reading Climate Strategy um, are engaged to to help and set up or, or um, think about different ways to solve some of these issues and challenges as well. Um, for those who joined, um, we've got another session next week as well because we um, couldn't figure out what dates were bi-weekly. <laughs> so actually for the next couple of weeks we've got weekly uh, sessions. Next week's actually a young wildlife photographer um, who's very engaged in the circular economy, sustainability, um, and also runs the podcast called Coffee and Conversationists, also for coffee, um, and has been also talking to really interesting people from kind of youth and the generation uh, engaged in lots of interesting perspectives. And then the following week is a lady called Liz from Love Heart Wood, who has a business uh, she's a designer and works with wood turning, lots of beautiful products, uh, children's toys, looking at the materials, so clean, healthy materials for children, um, as well as build it, built in quite a lot of little circular elements into her business as well. So they'll be the next two ones. And I will check the links and put them up as well. But um, anyway, thank you all for joining today.